Hey folks, George here. Uh, today we're going to tackle another work of Japanese literature. Today we're going to talk about Tale of Genji. Uh, Tale of Genji holds a very special place in uh, the history of Japanese literature, but also in the history of world literature. What do I mean by this? Well, because every uh, uh, nation, so to speak, every culture has its giant, its singular giant work of literature. Um, let me pull some out here for us. Uh, there's a couple. Here's another one. Here's another one. Right. In uh, Spanish, of course, we've got Don Quixote's uh, Don Quixote by uh, Miguel Cervantes. In uh, English, the giant of English literature, William Shakespeare's First Folio, right, of which these are a couple of the plays. In Greek, of course, Homer's Iliad, yeah. Russian, we've got uh, Tolstoy's War and Peace. And uh, in Japanese, Tale of Genji Mur by Murasaki. Uh, Murasaki's Tale of Genji is the work of Japanese literature that has been uh, discussed, written about, analyzed, uh, through Japanese culture for the last thousand years. Even more so, I talked uh, before about the Kojiki. The Kojiki actually had its dip for a little while and then came back to prominence sometime in the 18th, maybe 17th century, right? Whereas the tale of Genji has always been recognized almost from the beginning as a great work of literature and for the last thousand years, it's been discussed. Um, so yeah, without uh, too much more of an introduction uh, for a work that really needs no introduction, uh, let's get into it then, yeah? Now, as always, I will not be able to discuss everything about this work of literature. As we see here, it's, uh, the complete work is about a thousand pages. Uh, I will not go through all the characters. It's impossible, I think, to go through each and every character. I will not go through every detail of uh, all this plots and settings and all the historical and uh, textual allusions that are in it. That's just impossible. Like I've said, people have been discussing this work for a thousand years. There are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of pages written just about this work. You can find libraries probably filled with only uh, commentaries and scholarship on Tale of Genji. So there's no way that I'm going to say everything about it. Uh, I'm barely going to scratch the surface, as a matter of fact. However, that said, I am going to assume that you, the viewer, have already read it or know some kind of summary about it. So, And I've heard some complaints last time that, oh, I didn't summarize either the Kojiki, um, yeah, a lot of the stories in the Kojiki. No, I, I, I'm not going to summarize the whole thing, right? I want to analyze it. I'm assuming that you, the viewer, already have some understanding of the work and that I'm able to really go a little bit deeper into the work now. How will we go deeper? How can we go deeper? I don't want to summarize the work. You could find plenty of other stuff online and other places that will summarize the work for you. I don't want to do that. Um, that said, however, I am going to use excerpts from this anthology. This is the anthology that I'll be working from today. Um, the Columbia University Anthology of Japanese Literature. They've got it in four volumes. This is the first volume that goes all the way up to the 1600, uh, the year 1600, which is a nice uh, watershed moment in Japanese history. We'll get there uh, in a little while. Uh, I suppose we'll discuss that in a little bit. And this text only has certain excerpts of uh, the whole tale of Genji. Fur furthermore, the excerpts are only from the Sidon Sticker translation. Uh, We'll talk a little bit more about translations in a bit. The Royal Tyler translation is from 2001. Within the last few years, a new translation by somebody else, I don't have it, so I don't know, uh, has been published. I will not be discussing those other translations. I will only be discussing the side and sticker translation that we find in this text. Yeah. Um, what does that all mean then? Well, we'll talk about that in a little bit later, right? Because translation, especially for such a complicated work, is going to really take us into very interesting territory. As always, I'll be discussing my eight central questions. Uh, the first question, who are the characters? Why are they interesting? 
What is the setting? Why is it interesting? Uh, what is the plot and what are, makes some of the plot details interesting? And then finally the themes on the story element side. And then on the other side, we've got this literary structure. We've got the historical connections. We've got intertextual connections. And then finally, connections to myself. So with that, we'll move on to uh, the first question that I have. Who are the characters and why are they interesting? What I like about this particular anthology is it gives us a couple of pages of characters so that we can keep track of the characters. Uh, otherwise, I know that I am not smart enough to catch up and keep up with all the myriad characters that we encounter in this text. I find that also to be an interesting challenge of reading texts and literature from other cultures. The names are terribly foreign to me. I can't keep track of all the names because the names just don't sound familiar to me, like George or Tom or Jane, right? Uh, I'm reading, I'm just reading right here uh, at the top. The Akashi Empress. Oh, okay. The Akashi Lady. Wait, wait, what, huh? And the Akashi Priest. We've got three characters all that have the Akashi name. How, that just makes it that much more complicated for me. I love my Alfred Hitchcock, right, who, when making a film, said, you can't have two uh, female characters with the same color hair. One needs to be blonde, one needs to be brunette. You can't have uh, two male characters where it's the same. One has to be tall, the other has to be short. Why? Because Alfred Hitchcock knew that we needed to keep track of characters in an easy way. Well, Murasaki, the author of this text, doesn't help us at all, right? Because first of all, she doesn't even give many of the characters proper names at all. Akashi Empress, Akashi Lady, Akashi Priest. Those aren't their names, right? As a matter of fact, the only character in the whole story who has a name is Genji himself. Genji is his name. Everybody else is named for the place that they're from. Murasaki is named after a flower, right? That makes so much of this very difficult, certainly for me, New York City 2020, to understand. It's even surprising to learn that even during Heian Japan, the Heian era of Japan, when Murasaki was writing Tale of Genji, uh, Heian era is around the years 800 to about the year uh, 1185 or so, when uh, the Minamoto clan takes uh, control. Even during Heian Japan, they couldn't, they had challenges keeping track of all the different characters. So I'm very grateful to the editors of this anthology who give us just a list of characters. So to read this, there's no shame, no shame in reading this along with some sort of supplementary text. I know I have to read it with some sort of supplementary text because the characters are so complicated for me to take uh, to keep track of, right? And by the way, like I said, that is what's difficult about reading literature from other cultures. My uh, other favorite is Russian literature. Oh my goodness, Russian literature is so complicated because the same character they'll give three different names to. They'll call him by his first, by his given name. They'll call him by the family name. And sometimes they'll call him by the, pet, uh, the father's name right? Son of uh, Dimitri, for example. And that just makes it so complicated to keep track of. And especially since uh, Russian also has nicknames that I'm unfamiliar with, such as they might call a character named Alexander, Sasha. And Tolstoy and Dostoevsky just love switching between such names. And it shocks you because I'm, I'm not able to keep track of all that. It's okay if you can't keep track of the names while reading this text. That makes it challenging to read. I like a good challenge though. So to uh, get through that challenge, I do like certain guides to help me read through these texts. And I certainly need a guide to get through this text sometimes. So let's get then to some of the characters because uh, I can only talk about so many of the characters. We've only got a very limited amount of time here, right? Um, but the first character is obvious, Genji. So who is Genji, right? Uh, first thing that we know about Genji is that he's the preferred son 
of the emperor. His father is the emperor, and he's the preferred son of the emperor. Uh, he's preferred by everybody, in fact. Everybody recognizes how great Genji is almost from birth, certainly in childhood. Uh, however, one person doesn't prefer Genji, and that is uh, the Kokiden lady. The Kokiden lady is a rival consort to Genji's own mother, the Kiritsubo lady, right? And what does that mean? It means that the emperor's got many women and probably many children. And what this also means is that there's a ranking of the women and the children. And the Kokiden lady is up here, and the Kiritsubo lady is down here. And Genji being of the Kiritsubo line is also going to be down here, right? And of course, even if everybody va values Genji, everybody sees Genji and recognizes his brilliance and his beauty and all of that, it doesn't matter especially to the Kokiden lady, who's going to work against him. What does that sound like? I'm talking a little bit about intertextual connections now, but that, doesn't that kind of sound like an evil stepmother kind of role? And in fact, we do see evil stepmothers throughout Japanese literature, especially in this early era, um, and certainly later on in uh, world literature as well. The evil stepmother in, is it Cinderella? And things like this, right? Uh, and that's where Genji is. He's the favored son, however, because of Heian court politics, Genji cannot elevate to the, presumably his appropriate role of emperor. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that uh, when we get to history, because I think that we could learn a lot about Heian history from the tale of Genji. We see so much history, and we can see so much of the culture of the Heian era in reading this text. Let's move on to some of the other characters first, though, right? The second set of characters I'm going to give you are all of Genji's women. And Genji's got a lot of women in this text. In fact, this text has actually been said to be a story about Genji's women, not Genji. That's going to be an interesting question. Who is the hero of Tale of Genji? Is it Genji himself? Or is it the women? Or is it one woman in particular? Or is it maybe all the women? Or is Genji, the tale of Genji, actually the antagonist in this story? We'll figure this out because he's got many women. Because, again, that is part of Heian, Japanese Heian culture, which is polygamy. That's one thing that's revealed uh, right away about this uh, about Heian culture from Tale of Genji is the polygamous nature of Heian aristocratic society. Well, some of Genji's women are, well, the first one that we meet is quite interesting, actually. It's his own stepmom, right? His own stepmom, his own mother had, having died because, you know, she was a lower court lady and this is what kind of what happens. Um, but his father has to get another woman, the Fujitsubo lady. And Genji seduces her, has sex with her, actually has a child with her. That child ends up being Emperor, which is quite odd. We'll talk about that again in the history section a little bit more. Another lady that he has, uh, that Genji has, is the Rokujo lady. Why is the Rokujo lady interesting? The Rokujo lady is interesting because she might be one of the most strong and forceful and assertive characters in the story. Right? How so? Well, she's shamed by another rival uh, lady of Genji's named Aoi. And what does she do? Well, the way this narrative presents it is that she curses, or rather her spirit, leaves her own body and curses the rival Aoi and ends up basically killing her. That's quite fascinating. That reveals a little something about Heian culture that there is this belief in spirits, that spirits are part of the world around us, and that a spirit might not just be of a dead person, but might come out of me and express itself as rage or anger or envy, in this case, um, and actually harm the physical world. Aoi, in this case, right? Aoi, then. That's a nice segue to another lady, Aoi. Aoi is actually the only woman 
in Tale of Genji that Genji marries. She is Genji's official wife. Now, there are many other women, and I think the sign of the sticker actually makes a weird uh, mistake in translation at certain places because he calls, sign and sticker's translation calls other women the wife too. Well, if you do a bit more scholarship, a little bit more research, you will see that Aoi is actually his only wife, the only person he technically marries in the whole text, right? Despite the fact that sign and sticker uses the word wife in other places as well. Uh, that's quite interesting about Aoi. And of course, she dies. And here's what's also interesting about Aoi. Despite being his only official wife, Aoi is probably the only woman who uh, Genji just outright hates throughout the whole, her whole life at least, right? He always has, even though he uh, uh, damages and hurts all the women in the story. And that's why I asked earlier, is Genji a villain? Is Gen Genji an antagonist? He hurts every woman and every woman is miserable in this story. Why does a writer do that? Well, we'll see a little bit later. In any case, despite the fact that he does hurt every woman in this story, Aoi is the only woman whom Genji hurts and also never really loves, despite the fact that she is his only wife. Yeah. Uh, we've got a couple of other uh, women as well. The uh, only other woman that I do want to talk about is in the third part of the Tale of Genji, and this is after, this is the, the next generation, so to speak. And that's Ukefune. Ukefune is from the next generation, after Genji is dead and all the characters, most of the characters from the first two parts of the text are already dead. It's basically the last 13 books in the complete uh, Tale of Genji. Why do I think Ukefune is interesting because she is the only character, the only female character in the whole text to say what? I am happy. 446. She was happy now. They had all advised deliberation and she had her way. Ukefune. She could claim this one sign of the Buddha's favor her single reward for having lived on this dark world. The visitors left. All was quiet. We had thought that for you at least, said her companions, to the, more, to the moaning of the night wind, this lonely life need not go on. We had looked forward to seeing you happy again, and this has happened. Have you thought of all the years that lie ahead of you? It is not easy for even an old woman to tell herself that life, as most people know it, has ended. But the girl was serene. Life, as most people know it. She need no longer think about that. Waves of peace flowed over her. And that's at the end of the text, more or less towards the end of the story. We finally meet a woman who achieves happiness. Ukefune, in the next generation. So I wonder here, what does that tell me? How do I interpret Tale of Genji based on that little piece of information? Well, in a temporal work of art, like literature, like a story that has a beginning, middle, and end, temporal meaning time, it goes through time, music, movies, Things like that. In my estimation, it's the ending that's probably the most important from an artistic standpoint. What does the author do with the ending? And what has the author, Murasaki the author, not Murasaki the character, Murasaki the author, what has she done in the ending here? She has given one woman in the next generation happiness, finally, where all the other characters, all the other female characters lived miserable lives. How has she done this? Ukefune, I mean. 
Well, number one, she attempts suicide. I'll talk about that in a second. And then she goes to become a Buddhist nun. Buddhism. That's going to be interesting to talk about now, isn't it? And to end the text, it's not exactly the ending, but it's close to the ending. I wish Murasaki or the editors who came after Murasaki had cut the text at this point. Because I feel like this should be the ending. This is the happy ending. Life as most people know it. She, no, she need no longer think about that. Waves of peace flowed over her. We finally have a happy character. And as a matter of fact, talking about happiness, is Genji ever happy in this story? He's always searching for more, isn't he? He's always needs more women. And even as he dies, he looks upon his life without any feeling of pride or happiness. Rather, a feeling of resignation. This is life. And we get that feeling throughout the whole text, don't we? This is life. This miserable life. And that's really going to inform some of the Buddhist interpretations. Buddhism is rife throughout this whole text. And just read a few pages and you'll see the Buddhism. And what parts of Buddhism? Mostly that life is miserable. Life is suffering. Right? Now, there's a lot of different sects of Buddhism. But what do they all basically start with? Well, that life is miserable. And then what? Well, how do we get out of this miserable life? And it sounds to me like Murasaki, the author, is saying, here's how to get out of this miserable life. Become a nun. Devote yourself to Buddhism. Get out of life as most people know it. Don't think about that. Distance yourself from that because life, as most people know it, is only going to lead to misery. And so we see when we just look through the characters here. I'm sorry, I jumped right to the ending there, didn't I? But as we see these characters and we analyze these characters, I'm wondering if Ukefune might be the hero of this text, despite the fact that she only comes at the very end, on the scene at the very end of the text the last third, because she figures it out. She's the only woman in the text to figure it out. Even the emperor, there is no happy emperor in this text. We met Genji's father at the very beginning of the text. Why is he miserable? He's got no control. How does an emperor not have control? Uh, I'll talk about that when we get to history in a little bit. The power of this text that I find is something that a 17th century scholar, Japanese scholar, named uh, Norinaga, Motowori Norinaga, had suggested, which is the tale of Genji is the cornerstone text of Japanese culture. So Motori suggests. Because it presents this one idea, this one idea, this one theme. I'm jumping ahead to themes now. Here's the first thing that we'll talk about. And what Motori suggests is a uniquely Japanese thing, theme called mono no aware. What is this thing called mono no aware? Well, literal translation, the pathos of things, the sadness of things. And Motori, this 17th century, uh, 700 years after Tale of Genji is written, by the way, 700 years after the tale of Genji is written, Motoori says this is the paradigmatic Japanese text because it gives us the notion, the value, the aesthetic value of mono no aware, the pathos of things that carries on throughout Japanese culture. This ultimate sadness of things. Let's see if we could pick up some of that throughout what exactly he means and how it expresses itself, at least in Motoori's eyes. Motoori, the scholar. 
how might it express itself throughout this text? Well, let's talk about some of the other themes first. Love. Love. Obviously the theme of love. I met one person whom I take to be a fool. George, talking about a friend, maybe not such a good friend, who said the Japanese know nothing about love. Why? Because there's no word for love in old Japanese. And he seems to think that if you don't have a word for it, then you can't have, you can't understand this emotion. You don't understand something until you have a feeling for it. And since there is no old Japanese word for love, clearly the Japanese don't know anything about love. And you can disagree with me. I disagree with my friend whom I uh, affectionately call a fool. But it seems to me that this text, Tale of Genji, is all about love. This text tells us more about love than any other text. And if they don't have the word for it, I'm not sure that says too much to me. After all, it's a fact of history that most languages on earth do not have a word for the color pink. It's just the nature of uh, linguistics. Most languages do not have a word for the color pink. Does that mean that if you don't have the word for pink, that people can't tell when a piece of meat is cooked properly or not? I find that to be very unlikely and a very uh, uh, unconvincing way to look at human understanding. I think that love is throughout this text. And that is the problem of this text, is that Murasaki is trying to wrestle with this emotion called love in this complicated place called Heian, Japan. And how in Heian, Japan, in a polygamous society, can they manage this complicated emotion called love, what I'm calling love? I think that's what this whole text is about. Let me back up for a quick second. Let me go back to char characters for a quick second. One character I didn't mention, and that isn't on any character list, and that's the narrator. The narrator, the author of the text, Murasaki herself, at least the narrator Murasaki. Well, how do we see the narrator in here? We see the narrator in many ways. Number one, in the language. Those of us who've studied a little bit of Japanese language know that just based on your place in society, your language reveals your place in terms of relations to other people, maybe your relations to the rest of society, maybe the relation to your superiors or your subordinates. In any case, Murasaki, the narrator here, through her language, reveals her place. Number one, as a woman. How does she, a woman, write about all these complicated ideas? That's why I asked the question earlier, is Genji a hero or is Genji a villain? And the narrator is presenting him as a villain. Yes, the narrator calls him beautiful and the shining Genji, but is he really? Is he really presented that way even? This terrible aspect of love that is in this story is jealousy. And we see jealousy throughout, especially uh, most paradigmatically in the form of the Rokujo lady versus Aoi. The malign spirit was more insistent and Aoi was in great distress. Unpleasant rumors reached the Rokujo lady to the effect that it might be her spirit or that of her father, the late minister. Though she had felt sorry enough for herself, she had not wished ill to anyone. And might it be that the soul of one so lost in sad thoughts went wandering off by itself? Why do I read that? Because the narrator is writing about this complex character named the Rokujo lady in, an in a fascinating, and to me, a very modern way. This makes perfect sense to me in the year 2020, that somebody looks at herself and says, no, 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 I, I don't mean ill will. I'm not jealous. But then what does it say? Might it be the soul 
of the Rukujo lady, so lost in sad thoughts that the soul wanders off by itself and does its own thing. I don't want to ask you about yourselves. I'll talk about me. I feel like I've been in love. I feel like I've been jealous. I feel like my heart has been broken in such a way that I didn't want to feel jealous. I didn't want to admit that I was jealous. But what happened anyway? Doesn't the soul, I would say the emotions, sign and sticker says the soul. Don't the souls or the emotions have an intention of their own? That they go wander off all on their own, despite what I want to feel. How many of us want to be brokenhearted? But here's a Rokujo lady saying, I don't want ill will towards Aoi or to anyone. Yet, doesn't the soul do its own working sometimes? Isn't that how love works sometimes? Isn't that how jealousy works sometimes? That sounds amazingly modern to me, amazingly prescient to me, amazingly universal. I think I can ask anybody around the world, have you had your heart broken? And how did it feel? And do you have control over your emotions? And I think a lot of people around the world can relate to that short anecdote about love and jealousy around love and the pain that comes with love. And that is the rest of the story, isn't it? The pain that women feel around Genji because of their emotional attachment to him. Now, I'm just going to go through some of the other themes that I see that really jump out at me throughout this text. Certainly Buddhism is throughout, and the suffering of Buddhism, uh, the suffering of life that Buddhism suggests is just the nature of life. Suicide as a sort of uh, immoral type of thing. Uh, impermanence, that is, things are fleeting. Throughout the text, they describe Genji as fleeting and other beautiful things as fleeting. Cherry blossoms as fleeting. Let me jump ahead to uh, one line in particular. It does not do to be too beautiful and virtuous. You do not live long. Nothing in this world would be their rival. Why is that line interesting to me? Because beauty is doomed. It's impermanent, just like everything else. A little bit further down, nothing is meant in this world to last forever. And I love in this particular text, we have the footnotes. The footnotes are invaluable, of course, because they give us tips and ideas about how to uh, interpret and how to uh, inform ourselves better about what some of these things mean. And so we see in this footnote that this quote is from the tale of Issei, an earlier tale in Japanese uh, history. However, in the tales of Issei, it says the cherry blossom is dearest when it falls. Nothing is meant in this world to last forever. That's a direct quote from Tale of Issei. What I find interesting about that, now we're actually talking a little bit about the text, textual structure of this, is there are allusions to earlier texts throughout Tale of Genji. And so many of those footnotes tell us, oh, this is referring to the earlier tale of Issei. Oh, this is referring to some Chinese text. Oh, this is referring to some other earlier Chinese poem or earlier Japanese poem, right? In any case, I think that's a great example of what 700 years later, Motoori Norinaga would suggest. Mono no aware, the pathos of things. Look how beautiful the cherry blossom is. Yet it's over so fast. The cherry blossom only blossoms for a week. And same with Genji himself. He's too beautiful to last for this world. Right? And that is one of the lessons of Buddhism. Karma is revealed throughout in this text. Uh, and the cyclical nature 
of the text, such that earlier I suggested that Genji seduces his stepmother, has sex with his stepmother, gives birth, or his stepmother gives birth to his child. What do you think happens? What goes around comes around. So says karma. Later in Genji's life, the exact same thing happens to him. Somebody sleeps with one of his women and gives birth. Yet, he thinks it's his child. What goes around comes around, right? Uh, and I love that the author, Murasaki, how she incorporates these Buddhist themes as parts of the plot. That's why I'm not going to talk too much about plot today, because the details of the plot are mainly there only to explicate or explain one of these deeper themes like love, like Buddhism and Buddhist values. And here we have a case of what goes around comes around karma. The misery of life. Beauty is so important in this text. Why? What this reveals to us is how important beauty was in Heian, Japan, and especially in the aristocratic circle, the aristocratic court of Heian, Japan. In so many passages, they're talking about how beautiful women are versus how ugly some other women are. How beautiful the poetry is versus poor poetry. How beautiful Genji's music is, for example, when he plays his biwa. Of course, nature and the beauty of nature is given as a theme throughout many of the uh, Tale of Genji anecdotes. But I think one of the key themes that I've already touched upon quite a bit is gender roles. I think the author Murasaki is really trying to flesh out gender roles in Heian Japan. And I think she's even trying to make a commentary on them. That is, say something about these gender roles and how unjust they are. Or at least how to get around certain gender roles. Remember like I explained earlier, Ukefune gets around the gender roles, how? Buddhism and becoming a nun. So many of the characters, so many of the female characters wanted to become a nun, yet Genji doesn't let them become a nun. What happens? Genji dies. Genji's not there to stop Ukefune from becoming a nun, and so she becomes a nun. And of course, at the end, she says, I am happy. I'm overflowing with waves of peace. I skipped over setting and plot. I'm not going to talk too much about plot because, yeah, there's so many different uh, action elements in this story. Um, and I've already discussed several of them and how they really lead into. And by the way, in general, I don't like talking about plot. I don't think plot is interesting in many cases. Rather, what I think is interesting is how the author uses the plot to deliver certain themes, like discussion of gender roles, like discussion of Buddhism, like discussion of justice, which we'll talk about when we talk about history in a little bit, like talking about the nature of Buddhism. That's the plot. The plot is just the vehicle for the deeper meaning, the themes of the text. So let's jump back to the other one that I skipped past, setting. And the setting here is Heian, Japan, right? And I gave you some uh, uh, dates there earlier, but really specifically, it seems like this text is written in the 11th century towards the end of the Heian era, right? Where is Heian? Today, we call it Kyoto. Where in Kyoto are we? We're in a very small area in Kyoto, the aristocratic court. What does that mean? This story never visits commoners. All we get about Heian Japan is really the role and the roles and the functions of the aristocracy. We only meet aristocrats, that is, the imperial family and the surrounding court. There's one place when Genji is exiled because he had sex with the wrong woman, of course, the emperor's lover. And when you have sex with the emperor, what's the emperor going to do? Not the emperor himself, actually the emperor's mom exiles Genji to a place called Suma, which is just outside of Kyoto. But if you read the text, it's as though it's another world. 
I love how he describes this is the only time that we see in the tale of Genji any peasant folk in tale of Genji. All the fisher folk had gathered at what they had heard was the house of a great gentleman from the city. They were as noisy and impossible to communicate with as a flock of birds, but no one thought of telling them to leave. What is Murasaki here, the author, saying about the peasant folks? They're animals. They're like birds. We can't even communicate with them. It's the only time that we see peasant folk in Tale of Genji. That's interesting to me. You might want to explore that a bit further. I'm not going to. But there's a lot of writing there about, there's a lot of scholarship, there's a lot of research about the nature of peasant folk in Heian, Japan. There's so little known about them because all the literate people, like Murasaki, the author herself, were writing in, in the aristocratic circles about the aristocrats, right? So that's an interesting little tidbit there. Let's move on then to textual elements and the structure and the formal structure of Tale of Genji. There's so much to be said about how this text is written. And this is one of the reasons why it is a giant of world literature, certainly the giant of Japanese literature. Number one is that it's a mix, and we saw this with the Kojiki, right? It's a mix of prose and poetry. And there's about 800 Tonka poems in Tale of Genji. Some scholars, some researchers, spend all their research just talking about the poems. The poems are so rich and so beautiful. And certainly, in many cases, they really have that expression of what Motoori would have called mono no aware. Here's what's interesting about them. As I've said earlier about the Kojiki and even in many of the Manyoshu poems, they're all of the Tonka form. What is the Tonka form again? It's ultimately uh, five lines of five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables, seven syllables, seven syllables. However, in our text, the, uh, the translator has divided it up into two lines only. The first line is the 575, and the second line is the 77. That's going to be the structure of the Tonka poems in Tale of Genji. The first half is the 575 portion, and the second half is the 77 portion. Here's what's interesting in the original text. The author, the translator here has decided to put them in two lines. Most Tonka poems that I see are in five lines. Murasaki, the author, put them all in one line of 31 syllables, just one long line. And that's how we see them if you look at the original manuscripts today. What does that say? Why is that interesting? The poems in many portions of the text are used as dialogue, communication between two characters. What does that reveal to us about the culture of Heian Japan? Number one, that they're highly literate, especially amongst the aristocracy. Furthermore, people are judged on the quality of their poetry. And we see this many times where Genji or somebody else is judging somebody it says, oh, this person is great. Why? Because of her great poem. Here's a great example of that as he is uh, ultimately seducing Murasaki, the character in the story, the younger girl in the story, uh, Murasaki. And what does the exchange look like? Must you continue to be so reticent and apologetic? I've made my own feelings clear over and over again. It is precisely the childlike quality that delights me most and makes me think that I must have her for my own. That's Genji talking about a little girl, Murasaki. Um, in the year 2020, that sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? It's the childlike character that makes me want her to make her my own. We'll talk about that in a bit. But I'm 
feel sure that we were joined in a former life. Let me speak to her, please. And here's Genji speaking as a poem. Rushes hide the seagrass at Wakanora. Must the waves that seek it out turn back to sea? Somebody responds. That would be too much to ask of them. The grass at Wakanora were rash indeed to follow waves that go it knows no whither. It would be far, far too much to ask. That's Genji having an exchange with Murasaki. And then look at Genji's response here. The easy skill with which she turned her poem made it possible for him to forgive its less than encouraging significance. Basically, he said, hey, I'm like the sea. Should I, in his first poem, should I go back to the sea? And how does she respond? Hey, the waves go where the waves go, don't they? And he says, oh, I don't care about her actually turning me down. But the fact that she made such a beautiful, skillful poem really impresses Genji and makes her that much more attractive to him. And so it is with poetry in Heian, Japan. We see the role that poetry plays, and thus the role that poetry plays in this text. Not just in this text, but in real life. Heian, Japan, in everyday life, amongst the aristocracy at least, right? We also see these parallel structures um, where patterns repeat amongst different characters at later times, right? In many different places, Genji says, this woman reminds me of my mother. First, of course, with his mother, but then with Fujitsubo, then certainly with Murasaki. He says, oh, just as beautiful as my mother. This parallel structure that certain researchers have described in Pale, Tale of Genji. Why is that interesting? Well, I think this parallel structure also might be interpreted as a cyclical structure. Why is that interesting? Because I think that ties very nicely in with Buddhism and the Buddhist nature of the world, which is things go around in circles as opposed to linear time. It's of course an over-exaggeration to suggest this, so don't take me uh, too literally, but there is this cyclical nature. And of course, karma is the best example of that. I described karma a little bit earlier, didn't I? Yet that's exactly how this text is structured. What goes around comes around. What happened once will happen again. And the very structure of the text illustrates and really lends credence to the notion that it's a Buddhist text or that it's really pushing forward Buddhist values. The other very fascinating point about this text is that it's written by a woman. Why is that interesting? Well, number one, because of the social role that women play. That's all obvious. I don't want to talk too much about that. In none of the other books that I described at the beginning of this uh, talk, Shakespeare, Tolstoy, Dante, uh, Cervantes, nowhere else in world literature do you have, or very few places at least, uh, do you have prominent female writers before the modern era. Ancient Greece has a few, right, that come to my mind really quickly. And I think that there are a few in other cultures too that we could pick up. However, what's fascinating here is that this is the pinnacle or the high point of Japanese literature written by a woman, which is especially startling given the social status of women in Heian, Japan. Well, how does that make sense? How is it that women were even allowed to write such amazing works of literature in Heian, Japan. Again, the political structure of Heian, Japan helps explain this. Number one is men didn't write fiction. Fiction was relegated to women. Why? Well, the argument, and there's an amazing uh, uh, chapter in Tale of Genji that we have here, where she gets into a discussion about the value she has to defend. Murasaki, the author, writes a chapter defending fiction. She ultimately says, fiction is valuable. Well, why would somebody call fiction unvaluable or less than valuable? Well, it's made up. 
fiction is fake. After all, what has real value? The truth. The truth has real value. And that's what men were writing. History, politics, religion, philosophy, truth. Men wouldn't bother themselves with something so frivolous as fake lies, fiction. And that's why women got free reign ultimately. And when you do get free reign, look at what happens. This reminds me actually about the rise of black music in America. Think of the blues. Those black musicians in the Mississippi Delta, they don't know, let them do whatever they want. And yet what ended up happening? The blues became the cornerstone of American music, American popular music especially, because none of the, none of the uh, uh, elites would bother with poor black musicians in the Mississippi Delta. And so we see the same thing happening in Heian, Japan, a thousand years ago. None of the elites were bothering themselves with fiction and women's writing, which let women's writing thrive and blossom and gave Murasaki, the author, the opportunity to write this brilliant work of literature. And of course, this is the first work of literature that I'm discussing here that's actually written in Japanese. Because what would men write? Men were writing in Chinese. So many people uh, give credit, at least mythologically speaking, give credit to Murasaki, the author, for ultimately inventing the Japanese uh, katagana language and hiragana language, written language, of course. When you give somebody free reign like that by relegating them to a lower status, yeah, you better watch out because they might do something with that. Just as the black musicians in the Mississippi Delta did something amazing with the blues, and so women writers in Heian, Japan, did something amazing with literature. Now, I've talked a lot about history and how we can see a lot of history in Tale of Genji. But now I want to move into a little bit more about the details of history, right? What was Heian, Japan really like? Well, we see a lot of the aristocracy and the hierarchy, right? And at the top of that hierarchy, supposedly, is the emperor, right? And from the emperor, everything else goes down. However, is that really how it was? And what does Murasaki, the author, have to say about any of this? It's my interpretation of Japanese history that we talked about the Kojiki last week when the emperor was really strong in trying to consolidate power in ancient Japan. However, it's my interpretation that ever since that period, from the Heian period on to today, that the emperor never again really has the most political power in Japanese history. And it starts right here in the Heian era. How does that make sense? That's odd to me because whenever I hear the word emperor, I'm thinking of the most powerful person at least in that area. But it's not the case here. And I think that Murasaki, the author, has something to say about that. Who did have real power then in Heian, Japan? Well, it so happens that there were regents, the people, so to speak, uh, who were pulling the strings behind the scene. And during Heian, Japan, especially during late Heian, Japan, when uh, Murasaki was writing, it's the Fujiwara clan. And one figure in particular, Fujiwara Michinaga. Fujiwara Michinaga is considered the most powerful person in Heian, Japan. Who is he? Well, he's the father of a lot, or the patriarch of the Fujiwara clan, who birthed a lot of emperors. How did he birth so many emperors, right? He married off his daughters. Marriage politics. Wait, we see marriage politics right from the beginning of Tale of Genji. Right from the beginning of Tale of Genji, we see the role that marriage 
and proper lineage plays in Heian Japan. Genji could not ascend to the throne, despite the fact that everybody in the court recognized him as the greatest. Why? Because of marriage politics. The Kokiden lady wouldn't allow it. She came in, pushed Genji's mother aside, and made her own son the future emperor. And so we see a lot of these behind-the-scene machinations in Heian Japan, and the greatest puppet master, so to speak, in he Heian Japan was Fujiwara Michinaga. Well, it's interesting because what we also see then is marriage and lineage, the importance of marriage and lineage. But soon into this text, Genji, his rank, his proper rank, is taken away from him, basically to protect him. And he becomes a commoner, or a person without rank, despite the fact that his father is the emperor. Yet what happens next? He seduces his stepmother, impregnates his stepmother, and guess what happens to that child many years later? They all thought it was the emperor's child. Whose child was it really? It was really the child of a commoner, Genji. Genji. What is the author Murasaki kind of slipping in there? She's suggesting, it seems, that with this polygamous culture that we've got in Heian, Japan, we can't even be sure whose child is whose. What's that mean? What that means is we can't be sure that the emperor's father is really the father that we think it is. What's that mean? Well, let's go back to the Kojiki. Do we remember how important genealogy is to tracing out the imperial line and saying, look, here are the genealogy that leads to me, therefore I am emperor. What is Murasaki saying here? By making, and, and of course it's a work of fiction, right? Of course, just a work of fiction. But that's how she defends fiction in her chapter where she defends fiction is by saying, fiction can sometimes reveal truths that otherwise can't be revealed. Is Murasaki the author who did have access to the aristocratic court? She was one of the inside people there. Is she actually revealing a truth about the imperial line that we don't know whose kid is this? We don't know if this child even has the proper genealogy to be emperor. And what does genealogy matter anyway? After all, at the beginning of the story, everybody knows it should be this person who should be emperor. Yet, because of this ridiculous uh, marriage politics system, the rightful emperor cannot become emperor. It sounds to me like Murasaki, the author, is writing a very subversive story here very subversive story that is challenging the very foundations of Heian society, namely the rank system, where the emperor is at the top and everybody else comes down, and your place in the hierarchy defines your social roles. Murasaki, the author, seems to be challenging that, not explicitly, but kind of in an underhanded way here. You have to kind of put the pieces together. And that's what I love about beautiful literature like this. You'll forgive me. I don't like art that bangs me, bangs me over the head trying to tell me what to think. I like more subtle art that you have to kind of piece together and say, wait a second, is this what you mean? 
And that is one interpretation of what Murasaki, the author, is doing here, is criticizing the whole of Heian culture, Heian aristocratic culture, by suggesting, number one, that this whole talk of genealogy is bunk, because who knows who's having sex with whom, because that's absolutely what happens in the story. People have sex, don't even know who they're having sex with at certain times. You don't even know whose child is whose because there's all kinds of sex going around. There's all sorts of polygamy. And isn't that challenging the very nature of Heian society, the very foundation of Heian society? And I think that Murasaki, the author, is doing that, he is challenging marriage politics of the Fujiwara clan is challenging the genealogical system, is challenging, I believe, the very gender role specifics that are dictated to women in Heian Japan. And they're constricting women in Heian Japan. And why do I think she's doing that? Because she wants to be free herself. She wants to be happy herself. She looks around, every woman in the story is miserable, except at the end, in the next generation, in the future. One woman, Ukefune, will get out of this system, become a nun, and be overwhelmed with waves of peace. But there are so many ways to look at wonderful literature. Why is Shakespeare so amazing today? Because there are so many ways to interpret it. Why is Tolstoy amazing? So many ways to interpret it, so many angles to look at it. And why is Murasaki's Tale of Genji interesting? Because there are so many ways to look at this. By the way, given uh, our 21st century sensibilities, of course, I just told you that all of Genji's love, many of Genji's lovers remind him of her mother, remind him of his mother, excuse me. I think there's a psychologist, for some of you who are, might be psychology majors, you might have heard of a psychologist uh, who talks about things like this. Why am I so fascinated with this work? This work speaks to me on so many different levels. You'll forgive me, but sometimes I'm miserable too. Sometimes life looks miserable to me. That's why I love this work, because it speaks to me. It acknowledges my miserable outlook sometimes. Indeed, love makes me miserable sometimes when my heart breaks. Oh, when my heart breaks. This work speaks to me and says, George, this is life. Somebody asks the eighth prince towards the end of the text to teach him because he's, of course, a wise old man. And I, as a teacher, feel the resonance with how he responds. I have managed to find a certain amount of peace, I suppose, but when I think of the short time I have left and how slowly my preparations creep forward, I know that what I have learned comes to nothing and that in the end it will still be nothing. No. I am afraid I would be a scandalously bad teacher. Let him think of me as a fellow seeker after truth, a very humble one. And so I hope that you forgive me for being a scandalously bad teacher, because I'm not sure what any of this means. Here's what I do know is that some of this is helping me walk through this life that's very difficult and very challenging. And that, I think, is the best we can ask for from a great work of literature like this. We'll talk later. Bye-bye.